How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started in our uh, study in this lesson, which is a first lesson in a uh, new study on First Thessalonians. Before we get started, we need to make sure that we are spiritually prepared to study the Word. Scripture teaches that the dynamic for the Christian life is God the Holy Spirit, but when we are out of fellowship, when we sin and we're walking according to the sin nature, then nothing in our life, no matter how good it might be, is profitable eternally for, for our uh, spiritual life. It's only when we're doing it in the power of God, the Holy Spirit. So whenever we sin, we're out of fellowship. We need to confess our sins, which simply means to admit or acknowledge our sins uh, in silent prayer to God the Father. And instantly we're forgiven of those sins and cleansed of all other unrighteousness so that we are restored to fellowship. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer. Then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that we can meet together via technology in this way to study your word. Father, we're thankful that your word truly is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. It illuminates our thinking. It gives us insight into the nature of who we are, who you are, and your wonderful plan of salvation and your plan for the human race. Now, Father, as we begin this study in 1 Thessalonians, we pray that we might come to understand uh, the um, important uh, instruction that is contained within this epistle, and that we might accurately divide the word of truth, that we might be encouraged, that we might be strengthened, that we might uh, be challenged and motivated to press on to spiritual maturity in light of the uh, coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, a major theme in this epistle, that we might be prepared for his any moment return. Father, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In this opening opening message on 1 Thessalonians, I want to do something that I have been doing for the last 10 or 12 years, and that is to begin with sort of an overview, a flyover of the epistle or of the book of the Bible that we're studying. Just like if a person is going on a trip, a long road trip, or flying somewhere, you take a look at a large map in order to get an overview of the the trip itself, where you can see the beginning and the end and all of the parts in between. And then as you go into further detail on the trip, you break it down in the days in which you're going to be traveling and what you're going to do each particular day, building your itinerary from that. Uh, But first you begin with an overview to just get a sense of what it is you're going to be doing, where you're going to be going, and what things there uh, might be to do along the way. Once you get into more detailed planning, then you may go back and readjust your initial plan in order to fit some of the issues, the details that, that, that come up. And for example, I'm planning a uh, trip later on this summer, and it's going to be involved two or three days on the road. And as I was planning that, there was one or two particular days that I wanted to do certain things, but because of other people's schedules, that didn't work out. So after I did the overall uh, broad uh, perspective on the trip, I had to adjust some of the individual details. This is typical and important in any area of, of Bible study. One of the first things that we uh, learned in our Bible study method course when I was in seminary was to read through a book of the Bible, an epistle, uh, as many times as possible before getting down into the details so you can understand the broad context of the letter or the, the book of the Bible before getting into the, into the issues, making a note as you go along of important key words, key concepts, key doctrines that are developed within the book and what the different uh, 
sections of the book or the epistle may be. And then as you do that, that, that sets up sort of a tentative uh, idea of what the book is is all about and what the structure is. What happens then as you begin to drill down into the details of, of a book, then often you go back and you reevaluate your initial perspective on that book. So there's always a a a a movement from the the details, the intricacies of an of a, of an epistle or a book, and then its overall structure. And sometimes, if you've been studying it before, studying it over a long period of time, there's not a lot of adjustment that takes place. But any time you study a book, you go back and you read it again and again, and certain things will stand out that perhaps you didn't see to begin with. Uh, I'm not necessarily an advocate of this idea, but recently I read an interview with Dwight Pentecost, who is uh, one of the uh, true... Uh, Oldie Goldies at Dallas Theological Seminary. He matriculated at Dallas Seminary back in the 30s, and he is still alive. He's in his mid-90s. I think he still is teaching one course a semester. But in this interview, he pointed out that when he, as a pastor, uh, teaches through a book of the Bible, at, when he finishes, he throws his notes away. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not an advocate of that because you, you can always go back and look at things you've worked out and studied out in detail, and that can uh, be revised as you go forward. But he always likes to go to a book with a complete, fresh look because uh, from the time he taught it or studied it the first time to the time he goes back to it the next time, he's read in many other areas, studied other books of the Bible, and there's the whole well, wealth of uh, of related knowledge that now comes to bear on the text. So you don't want to be guilty of just always repeating what you've done before, uh, but starting fresh. Now, I haven't done a study, an in-depth study of First Thessalonians in about 25 years, so I'm roughly starting fresh on this particular study, though I do have a certain background and framework, but it was 25 years ago, and I certainly have read a lot and studied a lot in other areas of theology since then. But what we want to do today is get just an overview. Then in the next lesson, we'll come in and look at the typically introductory material that you uh, that you look at when you first study a book having to do with author, time, occasion, purpose, outline structure things of that of that particular nature so this time we're just going to do an overview so take out your bibles and before we look at first thess one i want to turn to acts and i want to go to acts chapter uh, 17 it's in acts chapter 17 that we read about the apostle paul's initial visit to thessalonica or Salonica, as it is known in modern Greece, his first trip to Thessalonica. We, this occurred on his second missionary journey. His second missionary journey began uh, as he left the church in Antioch. He revisited the initial uh, churches that he had visited on his first journey in South Galatia, Lystra, Iconium, and Derby, and then he moved, started moving west uh, toward Ephesus and the western part of what is now modern Turkey, and we're told that God the Holy Spirit prevented them from going there, and so they headed north, but again, there was, there, there was a, a closed door, and God the Holy Spirit was really moving them in a certain way. Now, we don't know how uh, God the Holy Spirit did that. We, all he says is the Holy Spirit prevented them from going to these other areas. So they're driven uh, west toward what is now Istanbul. Earlier it was by Byzantium, or, or even earlier than that, Constantinople, up in that area of the, the Dardanelles and the Bosporus. And as he goes up in that direction, he's led to Troas, which is like near ancient Troy. At that point, he has a vision of, of a man calling from Macedonia to come over. And this is the direction of God the Holy Spirit through the medium of direct revelation, giving direct guidance to an apostle 
and directing him as to where to go. Now, we're not given a lot of insight as to how the Holy Spirit did that in other areas, but at Troas, the Apostle Paul is clearly given direction to go to to cross over into Europe and to take the gospel to Europe for the first time. And so he left uh, Troas, took a ship across to Neapolis, which is where the harbor was, and initially he went to uh, Neapolis and then to Philippi, or Philippi as we say it in English. And and, and Philippi, this, he is eventually persecuted. He and Silas are arrested and they're put in jail. And this is when uh, we have the uh, famous well-known episode of uh, God, the, uh, God uh, freeing them um, from their captivity <clears throat> and uh, through through the uh, mechanism of an earthquake, and the doors of the prison are open. Everybody's chains are loosed, and then the pri- the prison guard, who was awakened, scared to death because under Roman law he would be executed if the prisoners escaped, came in looking for them. And the the guard then says to them, "What must I do to be saved?" And they respond, "Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved." So after that episode. Uh, Paul left uh, Philippi, and in chapter 17, verse 1, we're told that when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a major port city at the time, had a population of a couple of hundred thousand, and there they went, first of all, as was uh, <coughs> Paul's procedure, a synagogue of the Jews, it would have taken them a walking for f- four days, four or five days, to go from Thessalon- uh, from uh, Philippi to Thessalonica, and they initially went to a synagogue in order to teach. Paul, then verse two, we read. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, the word that we, the, the scriptures that he's using. Is just the Old Testament. There's no New Testament books uh, written yet. Uh, Paul has written Galatians, and James has probably been been written. But as in terms of any kind of collection of New Testament authoritative books, that hasn't happened yet. So when we read the Scriptures here, what Paul is doing is he's going to the Old Testament uh, scriptures. He probably uses the Septuagint, which was the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek New Testament, and he's going to Old Testament passages to demonstrate that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. I would just love to listen to those uh, those uh, talks by the Apostle Paul. We li- Just as an aside, we live in a time when there's an idea that has gained more and more traction among uh, some evangelical scholars, and that is that there's little, if any, genuine Old Testament prophecy related to the Messiah. In fact, there's uh, many people who believe that if there is one, then the only one that's there is Isaiah 110. There's a lot of pushback beginning now, thankfully, to some scholars like Michael Rydelnik and Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Ed Bloom, who was one of my professors at seminary, and numerous others that are uh, emphasizing the opposite. It really surprises people when I tell them that there are seminary professors that don't believe that there are, there are any Old Testament prophecies related to the Messiah. Uh, first question I'm usually asked is, well, what do they think that Jesus was doing on the road to Emmaus when he went through the uh, Old Testament scriptures to show how they pointed to him? I don't know. I've never actually had the opportunity to ask one of them that question. So Paul is reasoning from the, the scriptures, and he is, a, a, and that word emphasizes he's presenting a cogent, logical presentation of the Messiahship of Jesus of Nazareth to the Jewish community. Along with that, in verse three, he reasons by ex, by explaining these would be uh, participles of means by explaining and demonstrating that the Christ, the Messiah, Christos in the Greek is the translation of Mashiach in the Hebrew. So he's explaining and demonstrating that the Mashiach had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christos, the Messiah. So this is very clear uh, from this passage of Scripture that the Old Testament 
clearly portrays and points to Jesus in terms of his death, burial, and resurrection. So he is going throughout all of those, those, those three concepts, those three doctrinal points, and demonstrating those from Old Testament passages. The response in verse 4 is that some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. So he has some response from the Jewish community, but he has a greater response from the uh, proselytes. Now, these would be either the godly Gentiles or the proselytes at the gate, or maybe even some full proselytes who were Gentiles who were uh, in attendance at the synagogue because they had positive volition and they were seeking to know the truth about God, and so they had uh, uh, aligned themselves at least with the synagogue. They might not have been full proselytes, but they were somewhere along uh, the path there. And a number of women... Also, notice that that Luke emphasizes that, that it wasn't just men, it was women, and we see again and again that the Scriptures teach um, uh, a value for women that is not present in the ancient world, especially in Greek Greek culture. So often today, uh, as a result of modern uh, liberal feminism, radical feminism, the perspective is given that that Paul especially is just a misogynist and that he really had no no use for women. They always set up a false dichotomy in their in their arguments and what we see is that every statement that Paul makes about women is it elevates the status of women in the ancient world far above the status they had in either rabbinic Judaism or, or in the Greco-Roman culture. It's not the kind of autonomy that modern uh, liberal uh, feminists want, though, because their agenda is based on an evolutionary presupposition that basically men and women uh, are, are interchangeable. This gets goes to the extreme that you find in postmodernism that maleness and femaleness is just some some sort of cultural construct and doesn't have any basis in reality at all. But that's just kind of the foolishness that pa- where paganism ends up. So. Uh, Luke emphasizes men and women respond to the gospel. They join Paul, Paul and Silas. And then in verse 5 we're told, but the Jews who were not persuaded, uh, so they're not convinced of the argument, therefore they don't believe, became envious, so they're jealous. And some of the evil men from the market, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, these would be from among the Gentiles who had rejected the message, and they they incited a mob and and in fact, they, they created a riot in the city of, of uh, Thessalonica, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, uh, where, where Paul was staying, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged out Jason and some brethren, that would be a reference to other believers, to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. So obviously they've had a report about the Apostle Paul, about his message, about this new uh, followers of Jesus as the Messiah. And they've heard from Philippi. They may have heard from others. The word may have traveled. Uh, It's been a couple of years since Paul's first missionary journey. And maybe information about that from uh, Pisidian Antioch and Iconium, where there were also uh, riots and persecution of Paul. Maybe word has traveled. And so they're referencing that. And they go to the secular authorities in order to get them to to condemn and imprison the Apostle Paul and, and the other believers. Their accusation in verse 7 is, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. It's interesting if you look also over in Acts uh, twenty one twelve, where there's an accusation about the um, Apostle Paul denying uh, or prohibiting people from being circumcised or from reading Moses, that the opposition presents a totally false indictment. They're they're proponents of what some have called the big lie, the public lie, and their, their condemnation is not based on truth at all, but is just based on uh, their hatred and jealousy for uh, Christianity, which is not rational. 
and it leads to these kinds of, of lies and distortions. So the result is, in verse 8, that they troubled the crowd, rulers of the city, when they heard these things. Uh, <coughs> and they took a bond, verse 9, which would be like a bondsman today. They take it security from Jason and the rest. They let them go. And then um, that night, the brethren sent Paul and Silas away, uh, and they go from there to Berea, or Varia, as it's pronounced in Greek, Varia. And there, again, they talk to the synagogue of Jews there. So this covers a period from roughly November of AD 50 to January of AD 51. It seems like a very abbreviated time. He's there talking to the... Uh, the only real chron chronology we have is that the Apostle Paul taught in the synagogue for three Shabbat, so for a period of three weeks. But he's in Thessalonica teaching, encouraging, strengthening the believers there for more than those three weeks. He's probably there for two and a half to three and a half months. So most uh, scholars who work through the chronology of Acts would put it at roughly from November through January, November of 50 through January of 51. Now, what marks his, his ministry in Thessalonica is this opposition from the Jewish community and the persecution and oppression of Christians that rises out of that opposition. And that's important to understand when we uh, look at First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians because a uh, part of Paul's primary message there has to do with the reality of opposition, persecution, and suffering in the life of a believer during the church age. So let's turn to First Thessalonians chapter 1 and begin our, <clears throat> our little flyover of First Thessalonians chapter, uh, chapter 1. Uh, this is addressed by Paul, Silas, and Timothy. So Paul is writing this when Silas and Timothy have rejoined him. He writes 1 Thessalonians at the um, sometime uh, in the mid part of his uh, second missionary journey. As I pointed out before, Paul has four basic trips that he takes in the New Testament, three missionary journeys, and the, the fourth trip to uh, to Rome, uh, on, uh, where he's imprisoned. There's possibly a fifth trip between, that occurs between his uh, first, first imprisonment and second imprisonment. But in terms of understanding the, Paul's chronology and the writing of the books of the New Testament, it's easy to remember Paul writes one epistle at the end of the first journey, that's Galatians. He writes two epistles during the second journey, that's 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. He writes three epistles uh, during the third journey, that's Romans and 1 and 2 Corinthians. And then the, the fourth trip, which is to Rome, the, those are the prison epistles, uh, Colossians, uh, Philippians, Ephesians, and uh, and Philemon, and then he writes uh, uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus uh, sometime uh, after th after that, probably between his first and second uh, second imprisonment. So that gives you kind of an overview. So First and Second Thessalonians are written during actually during the second trip when uh, 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 they write to him very concerned about the death of some people in the congregation. They didn't expect that. They were Paul's teaching on the soon coming of Christ, the imminency of Jesus' return, was so real that they did not expect to die physically. And so once some members in their group died, either from persecution or naturally, they were upset because they had misunderstood what Paul was teaching about the immediacy of Jesus' return. And that tells us something about uh, the whole doctrine of the imminency of, of Christ's return, that no, no prophecy needed to be fulfilled uh, in order for Jesus to return in the heavens for the church uh, at the at the rapture. So this is written sometime after he leaves Thessalonians. He goes from there to uh, Varia, then to Athens, and then to Corinth. When he's in Corinth, Silas, known here as Silvanus, his Latin name, uh, Silvanus and Timothy have rejoined him, and that's how he's learned about the confusion that exists 
in the uh, Thessalonian church. So he says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, uh, to the church of the Thessalonians in uh, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll get into a little bit more detail about uh, the nature and culture of Thessalonica in the next lesson. But right now, we can just say that it was a major town. Uh, some put the population around 200,000. It's a significant seaport, so it's a significant commercial area, and it was also a, a military uh, uh, center. Uh, it has a, it's large enough to have attracted a significant number of Jews who have established a synagogue there, and so there is a somewhat powerful uh, Jewish com- community that leaders of which set themselves in opposition uh, to the Apostle Paul. As we look at the epistle in terms of its basic uh, basic structure and basic outline, it seems that there are two basic uh, divisions of the epistle. The first three chapters are very personal, very intimate, and they seem to focus around the idea that the Apostle Paul is encouraging uh, the Thessalonians in terms of their response to the gospel, that they are indeed believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and this has brought forth evidence that is undeniable uh, of, of their salvation. And, and, and just to address that, uh, it, it's wrong to think that to know you're saved, you base that on, on certain external evidence. But that does not mean that the opposite is not true. That is that as you look at a person's life that they have claimed to believe in Jesus as their Savior, that that if they are positive and they grow spiritually, then they are going to demonstrate that in their life. There will be certain evidence that can't be counterfeited by someone who is an unbeliever, someone who has just been, um, let's say, made a false uh, profession of faith or just claimed that they have become a disciple of Jesus. Uh, There is a supernatural work that God the Holy Spirit does in producing the fruit of the Spirit in the life of the believer that is that is significantly a a sign or an indication that someone is saved. However, just because that evidence is not there doesn't mean a person is not saved. A person can go into carnality. They can say, all I want to do is get saved. I don't really want to grow. I don't want to become a disciple of Jesus. I just want to make sure when I die I go to heaven, and I would rather live in the slums of heaven than in the uh, palaces of hell, uh, so to speak, to paraphrase uh, the claim of Satan from John Milton's poem, Paradise Lost. Some people are that way. They just have low expectations. These are the kind of people who, they they want to graduate from high school, but if they graduate with the lowest possible grade point average, they're happy. They're just glad they graduated. They have no great ambition to achieve anything in life. They just want the the minimalist approach. And so some people are that way. They just want to be saved. They don't want to grow or mature in their spiritual life. They just want to make sure when they die, they go to heaven. Uh, That's not the challenge of the New Testament. The challenge of the New Testament is that we are to to grow. And if we grow, that will produce an an evidence of of our salvation. But that's not the basis for our assurance of salvation. Our assurance of salvation is based upon the fact that we know that we believed the gospel. We trusted in Jesus Christ as the Messiah that he died on the cross for our sins. That's the gospel message. And we'll see that Paul emphasizes their belief uh, several times as we go through this particular epistle. Now, Paul begins with a prayer and a reminder to them of the way in which he prays for them, starting in verse 2. Now, this fits within a context of um, of a couple of different responses that Paul makes because he has been attacked, slandered by uh, the Jewish uh, leaders of the synagogue as they seek to destroy his message. If you can't counter the message, then try to attack the individual. That's called an ad hominem message, and we have to be very careful. As constantly, I get frustrated with uh, certain things that I read on the Internet. We may dislike a certain politician, and unfortunately, there are too many people who are willing to believe anything negative about a po- politician just because they don't like the politician. And the issue needs to be not on the individual's uh, 
looks or the individual's uh, lifestyle or anything personal about the individual politician. It's about what they do. It is about their their belief system. It is about uh, what they are voting for or the policies they are supporting as congressmen, senators, or as the president. It's about what they do, not about them as individuals. We do not need to lower ourselves to the level of the opponent by emphasizing an ad hominem argument. But that's ex- And usually people who focus on ad hominem arguments uh, go there because they don't have much content in terms of being able to uh, to challenge what they what they are what the individual believes or what they are actually doing. So the assault here from the Jews is on the character of Paul, and apparently one of the things that they uh, claimed was that the, this this conversion that the Thessalonians had was just some sort of emotional shallow thing and had no real. Uh, sp- uh, spiritual backing from God and did not indicate anything, and so embedded within Paul's response in the in, in chapter uh, one verses two through ten is Paul's uh, rehearsal of some of the evidence in the life of the uh, of the Thessalonians, and he points out five things. Uh, uh, there are five things I want to point out as we go through these these verses. First of all, he focuses on their response to the gospel. This is part of his opening sentence, which goes from verse 2 through verse 4, where he uh, reminds them that he's constantly grateful to God for what they have done, always praying for them. Notice, as we look at this, that he begins this opening section of 1 Thessalonians with a prayer, and at the end of chapter 3, he goes back to what he is praying for. That provides sort of an inclusio. An inclusio is like, in, if you have a military background in, uh, in artillery, it's called bracketing. First you fire a round, and it's going to go long. And then you fire a second round, you adjust your sights, fire a second round, it goes short. Now you've laid out the parameters of your uh, of where you want to fire, and the next, and then you readjust your sights, and the third round ought to be pretty close to being right on target. Uh, an inclusio is a way, a, a literary device, of stating something one way at the beginning and then repeating it in a synonymous way uh, somewhat later on, and that sort of brackets uh, a section. Uh, so it's a literary device to show the beginning and the end of a particular section. And if you look at the third chapter, we read at the end in verse 11, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love. You ought to highlight the word love as you read through First Thess. Uh, it's mentioned uh, a number of times going through uh, the, this epistle. He is emphasizing how they are demonstrating the, the, the unique characteristic that defines a disciple of Christ. As Jesus said in John thirteen thirty four and 35, that a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, and that this is a unique uh, characteristic produced by God the Holy Spirit. In Galatians uh, 5, uh, 20 and 21, um, 20, uh, 2021 talk about the fruit of the spirits: love, joy, peace, patience. Love is the preeminent uh, characteristic that God, the Holy Spirit, produces in our life, and so He's uh, He relates to their love as an evidence of their justification. May our God that they say, "May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another." And to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. So he begins with a prayer in verses uh, 2 and 3, 2, 3, and 4, and then he closes with a prayer in verses 11, 13. So that's the opening section that's more intimate, more direct, as Paul is responding to some of these uh, challenges. Now, it's also interesting to note that, as we saw in that prayer, that the, the focus of Paul's message to them in, church is in encouraging them is to remind them about 
the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we live today in light of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, because when he comes, the next thing in God's plan uh, after the rapture is going to be the judgment seat of Christ, that we are going to be evaluated in terms of our spiritual life and spiritual growth, what we have done with the grace blessings that God has distributed to us at the instant of our salvation. And so there are there's a focus all through this epistle on Christ's coming. In chapter 1, verse 10, uh, we read, this is the end of that first uh, subsection, and that we are to wait for his Son from heaven. Uh, this is, uh, not we are to wait, but that's what the Thessalonians were doing, was that after they, they were saved, they turned to God to serve the living and true God and to wait for his coming. So there's a reference to his coming in one ten. There's another reference to the coming of Christ uh, in 2.19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even with you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And then in 3.13, which I just read at the end of that section, so what sort of a thread that binds these first three chapters together is this focus on uh, the coming, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's mentioned again in the well-known passage in 4.15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. So he mentions it again in 4.15. And uh, again in 523, as he closes out the epistle, uh, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he is uh, ties the whole epistle together around this eschatological, that means an end time or last days reality that Jesus Christ is going to return for us and we need to be prepared for it. So anyway, as we look at this opening part here, uh, he talks about their response to the gospel and that he, that, uh, that he remembers their uh, three things. That's another thing we'll note here, almost like Jude. We just got through going through Jude, and one of the things I pointed out with Jude is Jude has this literary style of, of, uh, of three things. He has these um, little uh, uh, thing where he just constantly gives examples of three things. Well, this is not typical of Paul, but it is seen all the way through First Thessalonians. I have not seen this in other areas of Paul's writings, but it's here, and this is one reason why some people doubted uh, the authorship uh, being the author being the Apostle Paul, just because the style is a little bit different. Now we'll discuss that next time. But pay attention to this in verse three. Paul says, "Remembering without ceasing your work of faith." labor of love, and patience of hope. See, there's his his three things. And notice he combines the three elements from 1 Corinthians 3.13 that, that endure during the church age, faith, hope, and love. So he, rem- he, he remembers that, and that is clear evidence of their of the fact that they are the elect of God. Now that just simply, that that, that reference there, we'll get into it, is Paul just says the only way that we know that somebody is part of the elect is by their response to the gospel. We don't know it ahead of time. We know it when a person believes in Jesus. We know that they are part of the elect in Christ because they have uh, trusted in him. And so this is evidence of their salvation. In fact, to get the main sense of this verse, we could just say, Um, We remember these three things because we know of your salvation uh, in uh, your salvation by God. Then in verse 5, he gives further explanation. He says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only. And then he's going to define this by, again, an example of three things, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in assurance, the word there is a conviction. They had a conviction when they first heard the gospel of its truth and they believed in Jesus Christ. And so he goes on to say that these three things were evident at the time of their salvation. As a result, verse 6, they became followers or imitators of 
of the apostles and of the Lord. See, the key isn't imitating the apostles per se, but imitating them as they're imitating the Lord. We'll look at the doctrine of of imitation later on as we go through this in detail. And they received the word in much affliction. This is the uh, Greek word thlipsis. We'll see this mentioned several times. It's mentioned again in uh, chapter 3, verses um, uh, 3, 4, and 5. No one should be shaken by afflictions. Uh, That's uh, uh, thlipsis again uh, by afflictions. For you yourself know that we are appointed or destined. This is part of God's plan for our life. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 4. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that you would suffer uh, tribulation. Uh, this again is, is uh, uh, thlipsis. And then we see it again mentioned down in verse 7. Therefore, brethren, all of our affl- uh, affliction and distress. That's thlipsis again. So we see this emphasis on ongoing Uh, adversity. Now, the one reason I want to point this out is because as dispensation, as Christians who believe that the rapture comes before the tribulation, we're often under attack by people who distort and misconstrue what dispensationalists say. And unfortunately, in the case of some popularizers of dispensationalism, our belief has been distorted and uh, misrepresented, and sometimes we're our own worst enemy. It's very clear from this that the Apostle Paul recognizes that we will go through tribulation in this life. We'll go through affliction, hardship, and suffering. The rapture isn't some sort of a get-out-of-jail-free card where we're going to avoid tribulation. We're going to avoid maybe uh, tribulation with a capital T, which is really a word that's only used a couple of times for Daniel's 70th week. That's a more accurate term for that seven-year period, also known as a time of Jacob's wrath. It's a period of intense uh, suffering that will occur after the rapture of the church. But it's not a doctrine, the rapture of the church, that is, is not a doctrine that is designed to uh, give us an an escape plan from going through difficult times. As Paul clearly points out there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we are appointed or destined to go through suffering. That's part of God's plan for our Uh, for our life. So Paul says in verse 6 of chapter 1, you've become followers of us, you received the word in much affliction, there was a lot of opposition, and the result was they became examples to all in Macedonia, Macedonia, that's northern Greece, and Achaia, which is southern Greece, and as a result of that, the word of the Lord uh, went forth as a testimony uh, throughout Greece and even beyond, so that... um, that was part of their uh, their testimony. And then the summary is given in verse 9. So the five things I've mentioned was, first of all, their response to the gospel in 1-4. Second, they had become imitators of Paul and of Christ. Third, that they had learned to depend upon God, the Holy Spirit, so that they could experience joy even in the midst of tribulation. That's verse 6. And then the summary in verses 9 and 10, for they themselves declare uh, concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, that is, they, that is, the others who had heard of their circumstances, and that they had turned to God, uh, to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait. So they turned for two reasons. One, to serve the living and true God, and second, to wait for his Son from heaven, uh, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath, that's the orge, the wrath to come. This is another term that is used of God's judgment in time, and it's used of the, uh, in this case, it's used of the tribulation period. So that's his his opening prayer and reminder to them of the tremendous evidence produced in their life because of their positive volition to the gospel and their study and application of the word. They had a period of intense spiritual growth because they went through an intense period of opposition, suffering, and persecution. In chapter 2, there is a shift to deal with a second attack, which is a personal attack on the Apostle Paul in terms of his motives and his conduct. Now, this isn't unique to 1 Thessalonians. It does happen in several other epistles. For example, 
In 1 Corinthians, Paul has to defend himself against opponents in Corinth who, who personally attacked him. This is also true in 2 Corinthians and some of the other epistles. The Apostle Paul was constantly under personal attack, and at times he had to respond to it by pointing out the obvious in many cases. So he's, uh, he's challenged that, uh, that, that he's just in it for the money, he's just in it for some kind of prestige or power, he's just building his own little, uh, little empire. First couple of verses give us a transition. Um, Paul says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. He just listed all of the wonderful things that had uh, changed in the life of these Thessalonian believers. That his coming to them was not in vain. And then he goes on to say in verse 2, But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated, arrogantly abused would be a good way of translating that. It's a verb hubrizo from the noun hubris, meaning a, a, a excessive arrogance and self-absorption. And that's how he characterized the opposition from Philippi. It says, even though we were abused, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God, that is, the good news of God. Notice twice he uses God there, indicating the source of the gospel, in much conflict. And that's the Greek word agony, which is where we get our word uh, agony. And he then says in verses 3 through 13 is where he defends uh, him, himself in, in terms of uh, a, a per, the, the personal attack. He points out in verse 3 that, 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 their, that their message was not characterized by anything sinful. He uses three terms, again, to express that. They, it did not come from error or uncleanness or deceit. He then says in, in verse 4, but in contrast, as we have been approved by God, that's the Greek verb dokimazo, which indicates something that is tested, evaluated for the sake of showing its, its uh, approval or its value. And so they have been tested by going through these difficult circumstances, which shows why God uh, recognized them and entrusted them with the gospel. Not to be men-pleasers at the end of the verse, but God who tests our hearts. So their motivation wasn't approbation from people. It wasn't uh, any of these uh, negative things, which is what would happen in Greek culture, in pagan culture, there would be these teachers, these rhetoricians or orators that would go go around and develop their own followings. And Paul is saying, it's not about us, it's about God. And we didn't follow the procedures of the uh, false teachers they're used to. We didn't use flattering words as a cloak for covetousness. It, what, it's not about... Uh, it's not about financial gain or glory. It's about the message of the gospel. We didn't, verse 6, we didn't see glory from men. In contrast, we were gentle among you. Notice the grace orientation of Paul towards these new believers. And, and the, the words he uses to describe his, his emotional intimacy with these the, who responded, he they were gentle among you. Verse 8, we affectionately longing for you. Uh, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel, but also our own lives because you had become uh, dear, dear to us. And that word dear is a word you had become loved by us. And then he, he reminds them of how they, that is Paul and Silas and Timothy, labored and toiled in, in their midst. Remember, this is a time when Paul's conducting his own business. He had his tent-making business, which is another indication that he was there for more than just three or four weeks. Uh, he goes on in verse 9 to say, You remember our labor and toil, laboring day and night, that we might not be a burden to you. Uh, you are a witness, God also how, notice he has three uh, adverbs here, how devotedly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves uh, among you who believe. That's in contrast to the claim of error, uncleanness, and deceit back in verse 3. Notice again, it's that list of, of three. Verse 11, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. Notice another collection of three. So I'm just pointing that out as a stylistic thing. What's the ultimate purpose of their ministry? Verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The ultimate goal of the ministry is not how much you know, 
but what how it changes our lives. Walking worthy means living a life that uh, follows the pattern that God has revealed so that he is glorified. In verse 13, uh, we see a uh, shift a little bit as he returns to the uh, focus on the Thessalonians' conversion and the results of their faith that they had uh, received the word of God, which you heard from us, the gospel. But as it is in truth the word of God, it's not our message, it was the word of God. And it worked effectively in those who believed. That's the bottom line, is because they believed the gospel, they were regenerated, and then God the Holy Spirit is working in uh, in their life. As a result of that, they faced uh, persecution. Verse 14, they became imitators of the churches of God. This reminds us of back in verse 6 of chapter 1, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. And you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, talking about opposition from the Greeks and also from the Jews. And again, he uses that opportunity to remind them of the gospel. He's not making a, uh, he's not blaming all Jews for the death of Christ, but Paul recognizes both here as well as in 1 Corinthians 2 8 that both Jews and Gentiles were responsible for the death of Christ. It's just a horrible example of anti Semitism to just bl- blame the Jews. But here he mentions the Judeans who killed, because that's the historical fact. They kill both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. There's a whole history of negative volition among the Jews. There were many who were positive, but he's focusing on the negative side here. They not only killed the Lord Jesus, but as Jesus pointed out, how many times God sent prophets to the Jews and they rejected them and killed them from Abel all the way down to uh, to Jesus himself. And that... Uh, the, 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 these opponents wish to prevent them from speaking to the Gentiles at all. And as a result of that, Paul had to leave. That's 17 to 19. Now he's saying that we don't believe these reports that condemn us because I haven't come back as if I'm uncaring. I'm caring, I'm caring but we haven't had our ch- a chance to come back because of these opponents. And then in verse 19, he, in a very endearing passage, he says, For what is our hope? Or joy or crown. Notice three things again. Hope, joy, crown of rejoicing. It is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. He he may not see them again until that return, but you are our glory and joy. Very close, intimate statement there. Then in chapter 3, he goes on to explain why uh, he stayed in Athens and just sent Timothy uh, back to them to to uh, encourage them and strengthen them. Notice he says he sent in verse two he sent Timothy to establish them, stay rizo to give them a firm foundation, and encourage them concerning their faith. Paul is concerned that because of opposition they may uh, fall away. Uh, then he says. Um, Verse 3, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, these sufferings for you yourself know that we're appointed for this. And then he goes on and talks about the affliction they're going through. He's concerned that uh, Satan's going to use this as an opportunity to get a foothold into their thinking and that they will turn away from Christ. But he uh, he's encouraged by Timothy, who has now returned and given us a good report, verse 6, of their faith and their love. Faith here is not trust in Christ for salvation, but their ongoing uh, post-salvation faith. And then he goes on to say, Now we live, verse 8, if you stand fast in the Lord, for what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before God? He's very empathetic with uh, the Thessalonians and their struggle, closing out with a prayer. Then in chapters 4 and 5, we get a focus on the future, a focus on uh, the Lord's return and the implication of that for our walk with the Lord. Verse 1, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more 
just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God or how you ought to live. What's interesting here is the Greek construction, which you run into several times, which is called the hendiadis, where you have two words or two nouns connected together by a conjunction that's preceded by one article governing both. So it would be how you ought to walk pleasingly to God. That would probably be the best uh, best translation. Uh, we see, saw something, I skipped over it back in 3.7. Uh, it's translated, therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, and it probably should be translated because the word affliction there is a nake, which has the idea of distress, or necessity, rather. Uh, therefore, brethren, all our necessary affliction. Uh, we'll get into some of those details later on. But there's an important uh, study all through this epistle uh, related to the doctrine of suffering in the believer's life. He goes on with some practical exhortations in verse 3, that this is the will of God, your sanctification, to abstain from sexual uh, immorality. And down through verse 12, we have some very practical challenges to every every believer, and it's summarized, for example, in verse 7, God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness, and that uh, that is related to understanding our relationship to God the Holy Spirit. And above all, this is going to be exemplified by love, verse 9, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And so there's this emphasis on loving one another, and um, this is exemplified in a quiet life, verse 11, minding your own business, working with your hands, and then he comes back to this theme of our life, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. Then, having said all of that in terms of the spiritual life, he then gets into a prophetic portion where he talks about the end game. He's going to answer their question of what happens to those who have died in Christ now. And he says that that they, they're not lost, that they will rise first when Christ returns. Verse 15 um, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede or go before those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Notice three things again. Uh, we have this pattern of uh, triplets uh, throughout the epistle. Then we who are alive and remain after the dead in Christ rise, and immediately we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now when we get here, we're going to see a tremendous parallel between this uh, passage and John 14, 1 through 3. And the same ideas that are in John 14, 1 through 3 are present here. It's a remarkable parallel between the number of similar words at, that they're there, showing that John fourteen one through three and First Thessalonians uh, four fourteen through eighteen are passages related to uh, the the rapture that precedes the tribulation and are designed for comfort. Eschatology is not to satisfy some sort of strange curiosity about the future, but it is to comfort us in times of distress. Chapter 5, the focus is on what happens after the rapture in terms of the day of the Lord, which is a term for the judgment that comes uh, during the tribulation, and that those who say peace and safety, this is talking about unbelievers in the tribulation, how they're caught unaware and they cannot escape the day of the Lord once it comes. But we as believers should not be fearful of that because we're not going to be going through it. We are... Um, Distinct from that, verse 9, For God has not appointed us to wrath, that is, orge, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, a verse emphasizing that we don't go through that end-time judgment as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, but we will be raptured before the tribulation begins. Another reminder of the gospel, verse 10, that Christ is the one who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together for him, again, the encouragement, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And then we come to the concluding exhortations, a series of different challenges that God gives to the uh, uh, 
Thessalonians uh, that Paul gives to the Thessalonians in terms of of how they should uh, how they should live. And notice he says uh, three positive things: rejoice in verse sixteen, rejoice always. Uh, 17, pray without ceasing, 18, and everything, give thanks. And then there are uh, three negatives, don't quench the spirit, don't despise prophecy, and uh, abstain from every form of evil. In the middle of that, uh, uh, reminder, uh, this relates to test, don't despise prophecies. Verse 21, testing all things and holding fast that which is good is related to discernment on uh, claims of prophecy. So you have three uh, negatives, don't quench, don't despise, and abstain from every form of evil. Then he concludes with a uh, closing prayer, a benediction, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and then a great passage for uh, the components of the human uh, human individual, uh, of our makeup, of, of man, we're body, soul, and spirit, a trichotomy. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who will do it. And then he asks for prayer from them. Uh, brethren, pray for us. And then some closing remarks. So what we see in this epistle is a... a very personal, very intimate, very endearing uh, section on Paul's relationship to the Thessalonians, their salvation in the midst of persecution, embedded within that a great theology of suffering in the Christian life, focused on preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll get into this in a little more detail as we begin with the introduction, our introductory issues next time, and then we will start getting into the opening section and the opening prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things and to get this overview of uh, 1 Thessalonians in this lesson, and we pray that you will uh, encourage us and strengthen us with this message as we come to understand Uh, the totality of what Paul is challenging, not only the Thessalonians, but us as well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.